you know, I go back to the original Hebrew, and maybe I'm just a geek, so maybe your listeners. Oh like, yes, yes. This doesn't, right, you know, yeah. it doesn't help them out. But you know, it's really specific, right? I mean, God knows what He's talking about. Welcome to the Till and Keep podcast. Today I have uh, back with us my friend Dr. Ryan Hanning, uh, who uh, perhaps um, subservient to being a homesteader is also a, a church historian and professor, uh, smart guy. Today, what I want to bring up um, is, you know, in this Till and Keep podcast, uh, the the very title of it comes from the fact that man is called to work, that uh, Wendell Berry actually called, you know, he says work, the way he defines it, work is our relationship with the world, that when God creates the world, he places us in it and sets us to work. And that is what we do on the earth. I mean, so a lot of times we think of work as a necessary evil um, or something that we have to do to get money so that when we're not working, we can indulge our flesh and we can buy stuff we want. Um, or work is just pure drudgery, something that is just this necessary evil. Um, and a lot of us have that underlying view accidentally or perhaps because a lot of us are um, dissatisfied in, in jobs or, or the nature of the economy today or the demands of it. Um, but it actually is our relationship to the world itself. And it is the way that we serve God. I mean, our Lord, when he's on earth, he says, you know, my father is at work still, you know, and he talks about, I must be about my father's business. You know, he has work to do. I mean, this is the St. Paul talks about work out your salvation with fear and trembling that we as Catholics, uh, particularly Catholic fathers cannot view work as a necessary evil. We can't, we also can't use it as uh, something that it just fuels our indulgence or our luxuries, because um, that would be overtly sinful. I mean, that would be akin to uh, uh, an advertisement I saw for food of eating for the fun of it, right? That's where you disconnect the end and the purpose uh, from its rightful place or for its rightful, the purpose from its rightful ends. So our work, the purpose of our work is not just to afford things. It's actually a dignified and good act in itself. So in its most natural form, Work is what's necessary, and it's right before us. We don't have to guess about what we need to do because we're hungry. The, the first purpose of work, the reason we were set in a garden, is that we have bodies, and that the order of creation is that we feed those bodies. I think it's a, a nice reminder. If you ever think that you're God, just remember you can't you know, go a day without eating multiple times a day, I and mean, it's very ungodlike to have such a constant, needy, almost embarrassingly crippling, you know, necessity just to keep moving. You need food. And to make it worse, you have to get it out of the dirt, right? Uh, now that's putting it in the negative. There is clearly um, something good and beautiful. When God puts us in the garden to work, to till and keep, there's no punishment. I mean, that's, so we can't think of work as punishment. But on the other hand, we know that when God comes to Adam, and I think it's really interesting God comes to Adam and Eve separately, right? He doesn't just curse humanity or, or like give the consequences that you're all going to have to deal with. He talks to them separately. And to Eve, you know, he talks about the fact of her, her body and its ability to produce life, to nurture and bring forth life. You know, childbirth is going to be hard. You're still going to do it. It's going to, things are going to be different. And he goes to Adam. And what's interesting to me as a father, he goes, your work's going to kind of, it's going to get harder. It's going to get worse because nature itself is now going to rebel against you. Um, Ryan and I, Ryan, I guess we're both um, homesteaders and I feel uh, oftentimes more at war than at peace with my land, but I'm slowly making peace. Uh, but it's a, um, it's a difficult thing. But in, it, to bring up um, homesteading and, and work, I want to talk about this, the tilling and keeping, how these are sort of two separate commands in Genesis. And here's why. All of us men, all good men, even just decent men, even halfway decent men, even slightly decent men, they do work to feed their family. They do work to feed their family. And that's if uh, St. Paul, if he ever got, you know, the, one, perhaps one of the cruelest things he ever said is when he said, if someone doesn't work, they don't eat. I mean, that's like some just old school gritty reality that if you're a halfway decent and capable person. You're contributing to feeding yourself and others. I mean, and as a father, our primary concern is feeding others. And we feed our children. We feed and we hopefully uh, take care of them enough to be able to feed other people too. 
but so we work we work for that again that primordial thing but here's the thing we have such a disintegration in our idea of work that very often the greatest tension that a man feels in his life is that his work causes harm maybe just generally i could just stop there or that his work causes harm to his family um because work it's like water it's necessary for life but you can drown in it it can kill you so bringing order to that that's a whole you know if you uh, look at past episodes the uh episode with Connor Gallagher was really great about uh, bringing order to your home and seeing that as a work. Work is not just what you do for money. Um, it's it's work is how you bring order to the things you, you're in relationship with, including your family and uh, the world around you and your household. Um, but is, I want to use the agrarian model to talk about so that we can understand what this tilling and keeping means that, you know, something I had to learn. So we have a small dairy. So I had to learn how to graze because what I'm doing is I'm using cows um, to harvest grass, which I can't eat, to make it into milk, which I can eat. And it makes milk and sour cream, whipped cream, butter, cream fresh, ice cream, ice cream, ice cream. So we have cows, they turn grass. Um, but uh, so those cows need either grass or hay. But when the soil gives forth a blade of grass, that soil has presumed. I'm going to make this gift upwards, right, to these cre these other creatures that I have a relationship with by nature. And I'm expecting something in return because that blade of grass didn't come from nothing. So only God creates out of nothing. That blade of grass came from the soil and the soil made a gift of itself to make it possible. If you take that grass by grazing it off with an animal or by cutting it off for hay, you have taken away that nutrient. You've taken away what it took to make that blade of grass. Now, an animal, the reason they, you know, grass actually, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a monocot, which is a type of plant that puts nutrients upward and has its growing buds down low so that it can be eaten. I mean, it's literally created to be eaten. Uh, cows, when they're, when you rotate your animals around, move them around, allow them to graze, they actually deposit back more than they take. That's the interesting thing about cow manure, uh, not to get too technical or uh, I won't describe the the smell or even the taste um, is that that manure is actually better for the soil than if that grass were to just die and decompose on the soil that the manure is. So the cow actually gives more than it takes. And this is something in the order of creation that I don't think, again, right. Last time we were together, we were talking about the air we breathe. We actually don't believe that the order of creation, that if we work a greater fruitfulness will occur in creation that god ordered creation towards if we have ordered work that it actually will get better i mean that's the god put adam in the garden and said get to work but it, the garden was already perfect but as we do work if we work in accord with nature the creation which was already created good get even better when we when, when we're working in that way which is why a lot of our modern economic understanding is that no something or someone has to lose in order for me to win that the order of creation is actually not fruitfulness so god says be fruitful multiply till and keep the garden these two commands of fruitfulness we actually presume uh more of a competitive or zero-sum game of hoarding uh which is clearly condemned uh very explicitly in scripture especially even maybe it gets even more strict in the new testament um, but I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about our work being ordered towards fruitfulness. And what I want to understand, I don't think a lot of people consider why, Ryan, I'll ask you this. Why does God command? And I know there's different translations of this, and I'd be, it'd be great if you could tell us different ones. But why does he say till the garden? So get to work, but keep it, which I interpret simply as don't don't destroy it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And the original words help us, Jason. I mean, so I love to think Rabbi Akiva in the first century uh, is writing to his congregation. And he says, um, you know, God essentially created the garden, but left the world and man both incomplete, right? And having left specifically to man the responsibility to perfect both his environment and his own body, right? So like actually the, the type of work that you're describing so well is, is a very thing that actually makes us like God, right? That we can co-create and participate with God 
to bring about something that, that's even better than what what started with, right? So the idea of, of work as, as pre-lapsarians before the fall, I think, is really, really important. And, and the words itself are really, really key. So you know, if you look back at the ancient, ancient uh, Hebrew, when, when they start in Genesis 1, the words that we get for the, the, the way that man interacts with the relationship, or the way that man is in relationship with the world around him, the, the two words used are radah um, and kavash, which means to subdue and have dominion. Now, in a pre-fall world, that essentially means, hey, take on those things that make you most like God, that you have a rational intellect and will, and use them to interact with nature to bring about something even more abundant than what preceded it. Okay? Now, to dominion and so subduing, I mean, those words, um, you sound kind of violent and negative. And, and post-fall, they will become violent and negative. But later on in, in Genesis 2, he uses two different words that I think are really interesting. They're not... They're not in opposition to kabosh and radah to subdue and to have dominion, but uses the words, you know, essentially avad to work and shamar to guard. And this is this idea mm -hmm. to till and to keep. And if you look at the early rabbis, they understood this very, very um, in two ways. One, it's connected to the two things that make us most like God, that were made in his image and likeness. And, you know, the Hebrew words, if you're keeping count, you know, uh, tetzlem and demut, literally means they have a rational intellect and a will, that we can perceive the world around us and that we can actually choose how we interact and how we fall in the relationship with the created world. Um, and, and so those, you know, to, to essentially to work and uh, to, to keep the garden are connected to that intellectual and that sort of voluntary, that will component of who we are that makes most like God. And, and a lot of the rabbis sort of take that route down, which I think is really helpful. But there's another sort of school of thought, which says, well, no, actually, work and guard um, are speaking about what the natural end of work is, right? If you work the land so as to draw from it something it wasn't intended to create, you haven't preserved it. You haven't kept it. You haven't guarded it. So the word even in Hebrew, shamar, uh, means to bring something to its natural end, to its fruition, uh, in fact, the same word for Shemad is, is to keep the commandments, right? Mm -hmm. So we're called to, to guard the commandments. We're called, not only, it doesn't mean just like to protect them, that means to bring the commandments towards what their natural intent is, which is an individual and right relation with God and with each other, right? So, you know, I go back to the original Hebrew, and maybe I'm just a geek, so maybe your listeners, oh, like, yes, yes, this doesn't, right, you know, yeah. it doesn't help them out, but, you know, it's really specific, right? I mean, God knows what he's talking about. So this command Genesis 2.15 is telling us we got to work, we got to, we got to, we got to till the soil, but we got to do so in a specific way that understands what the end of that work is meant, which ultimately is for our own sustenance. And interestingly enough, also to fall into the rest of God, right? To actually enter into the Sabbath so that we would work well to be able to preserve the things that matter most. So to your earlier point, mm -hmm. that we would work not just so we have things, but that we would work so that we're able to make a gift of ourselves to receive the sustenance we need in order to live. And then, yes, to be at rest, right, to actually enter mm -hmm. into to life, which is not work, right, which is Sabbath. So there's, there's a lot going on in Genesis 2.15. Yeah, but that, a lot going but on with the um, podcast. That's, yeah, well, uh, hopefully. Um, there you made you made the point oh maybe i'm just geeking out on these hebrew words but i actually think in the common language of of men working um th this is this is something that we know right which is one i mean most of us just know intuitively we don't want to get to work for the sake of our family and then destroy our family right so there's there's just simply some discernment in the modern economic reality that um we need to get to work but we don't want to destroy our family by our work now on the other hand I think there is this over romanticized thing where, um, uh, you know, a great example is like Elf, right? So uh, in the movie Elf, where the dad is like this overworking, you know, all he cares about is money. Um, and then the kid shows up, he's like, oh, it doesn't really matter. I should start as, you know, and then he leaves, just leaves his job. I think sometimes there's this over romanticizing that, you know, dad's just, we're all overworking. And if we just stopped working and played ball with our kids, the world would be better. Uh, I think that's almost, that actually almost feeds into that work itself as some sort of evil so that we can do enough of it, but not too much of it. Right. So I don't, I think that plays into a little sappy, like 
little kid thing. I wish my dad would come play ball with me. Now that's true. Play, you know, have leisure with your kids. That's another topic. Um, but that we don't want to, we don't want to destroy. We don't want to guard. I think men doing good work. It's just like you, you know what it looks like when somebody that you're working with, um, just causes harm to everything around him because it's ultimately selfish, right? Whether he's just not careful with someone else's tools um, or he's not careful in his job, he's careless in his job. Um, it's actually a language, if you read a lot of Wendell Berry, which I know you do, um, you pick up where he talks about lack of care, which is this, if you read a lot of Wendell Berry, you know that's a huge insult uh, to someone to have lack of care. And anybody in the workplace, it's like working with someone who's sloppy or reckless. It's like, that, that's careless. And that's, is about, so what is that really to us? Why is that bothersome? It's because your work is totally for you or you're just for you. And this, this idea of, of sacrifice, of getting to work in, in a godlike way, right? Like so or when our Lord says, my father is at work, what's he talking about? It's like, well, he's, the work, creation itself is a work. And then he did this. Why? For us, because goodness gives itself away. Um, and then once it's giving itself away, then it has something to protect. So I think careless, carelessness and sloth, you know, the Proverbs talk about the the man that lets his vineyard go to brambles and stuff because he's lazy and how he can also ruin the soil. So there's, you know, from a, as a farmer, you can work the soil and destroy it. Yep. I mean, we, we did that on like a continent wide scale with the dust bowl. I mean, not the whole continent, but the dust bowl was, we had the mechanical ability to turn the soil and we got careless. We were busy. We were working. But we were, and ultimately, we did not work within the created structures of nature itself, which is so. This was, this is a theological problem to think that you can abuse without care and just do whatever you want to extract whatever you need from, from the land. That's a problem. Well, that's um, these two are so interconnected, right? So, I mean, you have to till and keep. Right. You, you have to till and preserve. You have to cultivate and guard. And so, I, I mean, I think, you know, if you just do work without the preservation or if you just work without the end in mind, it's just activism. Right. It's not actually yeah. you're doing something for, for the purpose of a greater end. And properly understood for most men, you know, our work becomes part and parcel of our identity. So we have to be really mm -hmm. careful that, you know, we just don't let our work consume us, but that we understand our work as really the way that we make a gift of ourselves in you know co-creating with god to you know bring about you know what we need for some greater end right so that right. we would work for the purpose of our family to have the sustenance and it's interesting because a lot of this in modern economics is in the abstract but the moment like you know you live on the land you know all, all modern theory goes out the window because if, if i don't if i'm not a good steward of the soil my, my tomatoes aren't going to grow and if they don't grow, mm -hmm. my kids aren't going to eat. If my kids don't eat, they're not going to want to work. And if they don't want to work, we're not going to till the soil. <laughs> it's like, you know, just right. we will die. It's going to be the Oregon Trail, you know, and it's not going to end well. And so I, right. you know, I think for connecting these two is, is really key. And the fact that we see it so early on in Scripture and that even even Genesis three post fall, you know, we we in Genesis four moving on, you know, we see these themes coming up again and again. In fact, I love the fact that. It's one of the few English words that the original etymology and derivation were kept in the Old English. So the root word for work and worship are the same because avad in Hebrew is the same word for work and worship. It's so like literally when mm -hmm. Moses goes to Pharaoh, he says, you know, let my people go out to the countryside and work for their God. And of course, he translated that mm -hmm. as worship. But what it means, because because worship is a work. It's the right. type of work that actually the end is to honor God. Right. Um, yeah. But it is a type of I wanted to bring a, I wanted to bring an article from Sword and Spade that my friend uh um Father Noah Carter wrote and he's he's talking about when I'm at when I'm saying mass, it's work. And he describes just the physical, he's like, You you try to say three masses in a row with the intense focus and devotion and then greet everybody and hear about all their problems. Um yeah, the uh, I know that Augustine went through a bit of turmoil when he was trying to describe the liturgy. He was trying to describe the worship of God, um, where he's actually the word, so the word cultus, he's torn about using it. He says, because it can mean to worship, but it also can mean like working the soil, which he was, you know, he's an intellectual. He's a little troubled with the servility of uh, like, that's kind of lowly. So maybe we should use that. I'm like, that is the perfect word. 
um, for for culture that and and in our work is that we are living in suspension, right? So we are above creation. We're able to look up to God, but we're also attached to it. We still have to work creation. We are we are like God in a lot of ways, but we are like create we we, we are creatures. Um, so we're coming up on the end already, and I can't believe this. But one thing to tie this back to our our you know us that are dads fathers. Um, it's interesting how often Aquinas, whenever Aquinas wants to make something fatherly, or when he wants to talk about something, it's like a father, whether that's like God or like father. He always says, um, because this is what makes a father. This is what make God makes God fatherly is that he plants the seed, and he brings it to perfection. Right. So that point you're making about bringing the the potential fruitfulness of the thing, which we didn't put, we didn't invent the fruitfulness of an apple, right? But we actually have made it better. The right. cultivars, the pruning, like this is why our Lord, you know, when he says um, that he prunes the vineyard, right? He prunes the branches. Oh, well, a farmer knows that grapes only grow on new wood. It has to be pruned. And that's in its nature and that your work, although it might appear at times to be violent, to be, to cause, like pruning is not a, you know, if we're thinking about it from, from our perspective, we're getting pruned. That's, that causes us some sort of harm. Um, even tilling, tilling the soil. If someone tills, are you a no-till guy or do you do some tilling? Or limited till. Limited till. Okay, we do too. And the reason is, if you know, tilling is like, in, it's you get instant, all this fluffy soil. It's beautiful. There's no weeds. But it is a massive act of violence, meaning it mm-hmm. kind of a get, soil doesn't till itself. It actually builds slowly. So soil, soil builds upward from, you know, things falling on top of it. Tilling is something we can do quick. But if you don't return with with mulch or uh, cover crops or something, then that tilled soil could just wash away and it's gone and it, it can take a long time to rebuild it. But back, back to Aquinas, he says, you know, it, what makes us fatherly in our work is that we plant the seeds, right? Of course, we know what that means but with our children, with our work, everything is that we tend it, we guard it to fruitfulness, which is an active thing, right? We have to, that is us doing something. But it's also us submitting to the reality that we didn't create it. We're not God. We're like God. But we are. So in that in that act of bringing something to its fruitfulness, whether it's you know stuff we do at work, our children, our gardens, our own uh, character, it's that we are in that act recognizing God is creator. We're submitting to the to the nature that he put there in these things. But then we're also able to be co-creator with God. We're actually doing something that would not happen without us. So we we become sort of submitted to the thing, um, but also exercising like a dominion uh, over it at the same time. So it's just something very unique to us as man. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I see this as, as a father myself, right? Like what I want more than anything else is for my children to be able to join me on a mission and actually contribute to it. Where like the end product that like we came up with was not worse, but better than what I could have done on my own. Now, God is not in need of us, but as a loving father, he allows us and calls us to participate in the mission that he's given us. And you know, the whole idea of, of, of you know, to, to till and to keep, you know, to, to both work and to preserve, um, I think mm-hmm. is right along with that idea of like coming alongside of the Lord and the mission that he has given us and allowing him to find the light. In the fact that what we're producing is actually even beyond what was originally in the nature of the thing itself, right? Uh, which is really like blows your mind. And you know, you can yeah. you can read the church fathers; they talk about this in all, all sorts of poetic ways. But the reality is that we're we're called to co-create with God, um, right? We which see makes that in our offspring, this is... but we see that in the garden. We see that, in, and we should see that in our work too. And it doesn't have to be, yeah. you know, on the land. It could be as an engineer or you know, as a teacher, where you you can see the right. fruit. If you if you do work and preserve, if you do you know till and keep, um, yeah, uh, that's the in our work. I know uh, the Benedictine motto gets translated as like work and prayer, but it's really almost just work. Um, I think actually, I think actually in the in the rule, correct me if I'm wrong. It's it's not ora et labora, but labora et let's see est ora. So work is prayer. Prayer um, and. It, to your point about inviting your children in, this is another, you know, when Aquinas wrestles with prayer, like why do we make petitions to God? He says, we're not changing his mind. I mean, that's kind of absurd. 
Um, so why are we making petitions? Why, like, you know, this is, and it's a serious question. Why are we going to pray? If you can't change God's mind, why are you praying? So I love, you know, Aquinas deals with hard questions. And um, he says, that, though, this is the way, though, that God has willed to make this thing happen was to invite you into the work of it so that by your prayer, that's how he wants it to occur. So when we, you know, I, you, you talked about there's there's no greater delight than when you're doing something. And let me tell you, I've got young kids. They're wildly unhelpful and incapable when they start out. <laughs> but you want them to be like you're better at it. Right. Um, but you want to do it with them. So you give them ways to participate in that work. Um which shows how important it is um, being a father in, in our work, being integrated as much as possible with our household and cause and being good to our household. But then when they invite to into that work, they almost that's that is the better way, or that is the normative way to actually mm-hmm. be children. This is why it's when our Lord, when when uh when he's found in the temple, you know, where were you? He's like, I must be about my father's business. I gotta do his work. You know? Ryan, thank you for uh being on the till and keep, that was a, I mean, I don't even, I don't think we've ever had somebody quote that many uh, Hebrew words. So uh, <laughs> some sort of your bonus is in the mail. Uh, thank you for all you do. I appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. God bless. This episode of Till and Keep has been brought to you by Tan, Fraternus, and Sword and Spade. Till and Keep is a podcast that shows how the primordial command from God to Adam to till and keep the garden applies whether you toil on a farm or in a concrete jungle. Visit tillandkeeppodcast.com to subscribe and follow the show. And use coupon code TILL25 to get 25% off your next order at tanbooks.com.